As uh, many of us will be away from Mass this Palm Sunday, could I suggest reading the Gospel account that we would have heard at the start when the branches are blessed by the door of church? The Palm Sunday account is found in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. The saying goes, what the word does for the ears, the icon does for the eyes. And so here is Duccio's painting from the Maesta altarpiece, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Someone has called this scene one, as the image would have been placed on the bottom far left of the altarpiece and all the other scenes of Jesus' passion would have been placed up and down and to the right, like a great book. This is a tall painting in order to make room for all the landscape and architectural features that Duccio includes. Indeed, he's painted all of Jerusalem to look like his city in medieval Siena. Look at the cobblestone road, all the walls, the turrets, and the arches. He's even included a grand white marble many-sided building that resembles a medieval baptistry. I wonder if Duccio included this building so that we might think about our own baptism, where we met Jesus for the first time, the Jesus who rode into Jerusalem and went on to die for love of us. <clears throat> then Duccio has filled the scene with crowds of people who are climbing trees, they're hanging out of windows and over walls. Some are there to welcome Jesus, others are just rubberneckers. It's like one of those great Bible story movies we've seen. Duccio seems to depict his own cast of thousands. But I have to wonder why there's only one woman in the whole scene. She's leaning along the top of the wall with a bunch of guys. And I'm wondering, what's that about? The gospel doesn't tell us that there weren't any women around in that crowd. The gospel only uses words like crowds and the people who were in turmoil but I'm going to give Duccio the benefit of the doubt and imagine perhaps that he saved the women for the best part of the story, for the women were the myrrh bearers of Easter morning and the first recipients of resurrection news. Notice that as Jesus rides on into Jerusalem, his head is up. He's setting his eyes on Jerusalem and the great work that he will accomplish there. Notice, too, that Jesus is riding the donkey, which we're told about in Matthew's Gospel. We see the donkey and her colt following alongside. The Old Testament verse, which is quoted, calls the donkey a beast of burden. But now Jesus is the beast of burden. He's the sin carrier. And like a work animal, Jesus carries the heavy load of all the foulness of humankind, the blood money, the blood-soaked battlefields, the waste, all of our conscious and unconscious stupidity, our arrogance, the greedy exploitation of people, animals, the plants, the oceans, the earth itself, the hate crimes. Jesus carried all of this in love. But the donkey is also an animal that's hit. It's yelled at. It's overloaded. The donkey works in the heat and the cold. We see paintings showing pregnant Mary seated on a donkey going to Bethlehem. The donkey appears in the Christmas story alongside the ox 
in the manger. The donkey carries the Holy Mother and her infant child to Egypt for safety and then back. You'd think the Christian world would hold this humble animal in the highest and most grateful, gentle esteem for its service to the work of God. How ungrateful we are. The experts who conserve great works of art are able to see with infrared light that there are a number of layers to this painting. There's a lot going on underneath. Apparently, Duccio changed his mind a number of times about where to place the road or how to position Jesus. Well, that's how it is to be human, to change one's mind. Some people never change their minds. They don't think. They don't read. They never ask important questions. They made up their minds years ago and have stuck to it defensively ever since. They pride themselves on never changing their minds. They have no regrets about anything. They never admit to an error. They never repent. They never say sorry. But I'd say that to be alive, to be really alive, is to change one's mind. Notice too, behind Jesus' halo, we see a withered leafless tree. Look carefully. Maybe it's the fig tree in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 to 9, which Jesus stumbled upon one day and found to be barren. Some say it's the tree of the Garden of Eden, but I don't think that we need to theologize everything. I'd say the tree simply symbolizes us. Some people never bear fruit for Christ. They may have been introduced to Christ in the sacraments of their childhood. They may have had plenty of religious instruction, but never borne the fruit of suffering love for Christ and other people. A whole nation can be like that barren tree. I'm thinking of all the countries that have built themselves up over history into an empire while enslaving people, making wars to conquer territory, filling their museums and their palaces with things that were stolen from other cultures, plundering the earth and the environment for the resources that they then sent back home. These empires are called Christian countries, but they're not really. Notice that the people in the back of the crowd are bigger than the ones who are up front. Some say that painters in Duccio's time didn't yet understand perspective. I'd say Duccio did it deliberately to show that this is an eternal event and not limited to a historical moment 2,000 plus years ago. Duccio isn't trying to do what a camera would have done if cameras had existed in his day. We see this kind of odd perspective in Byzantine icons where all of the angles in a room and the furnishings go off in different directions. It means that these Christ events are outside of time. As heavenly, earthly events, they don't follow the usual rules. Maybe we can end this little reflection time with a prayer. Oh Jesus, most of the country can't get to Mass today to hear the story of your entering Jerusalem. But I am here, and in my heart, entering the city too, through Duccio's open gate, not for the day's drama, the waving of branches, the shouting out, the laying down of cloaks, but I am here to love you simply, like the little colt alongside its mother. Amen.
Well, thank you for tuning in on Palm Sunday. God bless you. God bless your family. These difficult days. Keep you safe. Keep you well.